Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome to this second webinar of ESICM's Alive Solidarity series, focusing on the care of patients suffering from war related trauma injuries. My name is Raj Saha. I'm a civilian intensivist working in the UK, and it's my pleasure to be co moderating this session with Carol Bullinger. Carol is a consultant nurse in critical care in the UK and part of the ESICM's training and education committee. This webinar will focus on the pre-hospital care for battlefield injuries and hemorrhagic shock management. The aim is for the next hour and a half to be interactive, so please post any questions you have in the chat box. These free webinars are open to all healthcare professionals, and we hope they are of use, especially to any colleagues who are involved with the present humanitarian crisis in Ukraine or its neighbouring countries. We are fortunate to have two experts with us today, and I'd like to hand over to Carol to introduce them. Carol? Thank you very much, Raj. It's a real pleasure to be here. We are uh, delighted to uh, welcome uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Claire Park and um, um, General Sylvain uh, Orsay, who are going to um, have an interactive session with us today. Uh, Claire and Sylvain, would you like to... Uh, introduce yourselves and give a little bit of background uh, for uh, this session. Yeah, I, I, I can start. Apologies um, for the noise in the background before I start. Um, there's some drilling going on in the hospital. Um, hopefully you can hear me and thank you very much for inviting me to join you. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to hopefully share some of the learning um, that I've had over the last few 22 years as a, a military consultant um, and also working with uh, at a trauma centre uh, in London. So my, my job um, in London is at a, as an intensive care consultant um, and an anaesthetist, King's College Hospital. Um, and I've been in the British Army for the last 22 years, deploying both with an infantry battalion and um, with uh, the medical emergency response team, uh, which is our, essentially our version of pre-hospital care in the military, um, and also with London's Air Ambulance for, the, uh, for, the, for an, a number of years as well. Um, I've also worked on the civilian side of response to high threat incidents, um, looking at the response to terrorist events, both in the UK and abroad. Um, so hopefully all of these things I can bring together uh, in some way to share some useful tips. Um, what I would like to just say is that clearly it's a very different setting to some people who are working in Ukraine at the moment. And so um, I'm very humbled to be able to share any little thing, but I do realise that's a very different situ situation and it won't directly relate. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Sylvain Ossé. I'm a professor of anesthesia and intensive care in the French military. I'm in the military for more than 38 years now. I've been deployed several times uh, in the past. And I'm now the director of the French Military Medical School. Thank you both very much. Uh, Claire, if you'd like to start us off talking about uh, pre-hospital assessment of uh, battlefield injuries, do please um, post your questions um, and we can stop and get, um, and get the thoughts of uh, the whole panel to your questions. It's very important. This is an intera interactive session, so please do post your questions. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if um, maybe I, you would be able to start sharing my slides if that's possible. Um, and um, I'm just going to start with a little bit of an overview of how we um, work in terms of UK battlefield um, care is the, the, the levels of care that we have. Um, as I said, we're lucky to work in a system both in the military and civilian world in the UK, um, in which we have a very um, well set up response. Um, and when we deploy, I think probably some of you heard from my colleague Sam Hutchings last week, who will have described some of the pre-planning that we have when we deploy. Um, 
So from a military point of view, we have um, levels of care, essentially, which are that, that initial point of wounding and, and, and the people next to the person that's injured, their mate, their, their, the soldiers with them. Um, all of our soldiers have battlefield first aid training, and that's really, really crucial, which I'll come on to explain why. But essentially, those injuries that that need um, immediate response, they are going to kill people in the first kind of five to ten minutes, really need someone next to them to be able to do something about them. Um, and that's where that battle field first aid training for all of our soldiers becomes absolutely vital. We then have a system where we have a, a GP and some combat medics who will be relatively nearby or certainly within a, a short time frame of responding to um, that the, the soldiers that are injured um, or civilians that are injured. Um, and then further back, we have what we call the dressing station or the field surgical team, which would be available within an hour or two. Um, and then further back than that, we'd have the field hospital, or the, what, what's classed as a, a NATO Royal Three um, hospital. And then the sort of UK equivalent would be the, the Royal Four when they come back to the UK. Um, we bypass some of that sort of old school traveling between the different roles by by the medical emergency response team that is uh, advanced pre-hospital care asset that we've had in the UK military for the last few years and we're very privileged or we certainly were in Afghanistan to have essentially a dedicated um, vehicle or aircraft available for that team to deploy with clearly that's not always going to be the case even for us now but in many situations having a dedicated vehicle or aircraft um, is not necessarily um, a, an option but what I thought I would do is just kind of cover some of the learning and the ways we've set that up. Um, if you do have the option of doing that, because it certainly can make your life easier if you have the, the availability of doing that. Um, it's very different circumstances depending on where, where you are. And these are two very different examples of um, operating theatres that I've worked in. So you've got the sort of Camp Bastion one on your left, which has got multiple surgical teams, um, you know, multiple resources, a blood lab um, there where the, 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 the lab technicians would come to us in theatre and ask us what we needed next. We really weren't that short of supplies. And actually none of our distances from, from where our soldiers were in Helmand province was that far from Camp Bastion. So we had a very different setup and ability to provide critical care, operating resuscitation um, in, that, in that environment compared to this sort of forward surgical team that you can see in the other picture, which is basically a tent with a, a, a set of trestles as the operating table. And, and that, that whole tent, that's a quarter of the tent. So the whole tent would just be three tables, trestles, a small blood bank, one person running in. And so definitely that's where, when we come on to talk about the sort of blood supplies, where Sylvan um, will come in with some of his his thoughts on, on, on how we can, can combat that problem. Um, but the resources available, the available space to resuscitate people, the numbers of people, that will vary. And so obviously in a very resource, if, if it's resource poor scenario, if you don't have a field surgical team nearby, then the situation will be different. Um, Relating that to civilian work world in the UK, obviously, our yes, civilian pre-hospital care is a little bit different in that we have the luxury normally of being able to get out of our, our aircraft or get out of our car and do whatever we need to do by the roadside in relative safety um, before we move the patient. Whereas where it's a high threat scenario, so such as a terrorist attack that we've, we, we've sort of had in the UK, uh, this becomes a little bit more re um, related to the military side of things where we have an area where there's direct threat or a hot zone area and then a, a warm zone where there's maybe a threat but it's a bit safer and the cold zone would be your sort of as safe as it can get area um, and this makes the the um, getting the medical people or the, the medical intervention to the patients harder as it does in a military setting where there's a threat and you can't just get the people in there that you want to get in. Um, and so, and actually across the, the world, there's um, people have taken those tactical combat casualty care guidelines that a lot of militaries have taken and translated those into a civilian context where there may be children and, and older people injured and like the military context which is typically soldiers um, and the tactical emergency casualty care um, or the committee for tactical emergency casualty care have have set up guidelines that work within this framework of a civilian sort of setting and I mentioned that because 
actually they have also taken their guidelines um, and translated their guidelines into Ukrainian as well. So I think that's um, a really useful um, website for people to go to. And it talks about those, those phases of care. So the direct threat where there's a hot zone and it's not very easy to provide much care and you need to keep yourself safe to the indirect threat where you can do a little bit more to the on the way out where it's a little bit safe or you're moving the patient and that key bit is getting the patient out and we'll come on to talk a little bit about the types of injuries and what people need but one of the key bits here is if you have a patient injured with non-compressible bleeding that those patients really need to be moved as quickly as possible to a surgical table and the sort of flow acceleration of making the decision to move them quickly is really key for those 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 patients where we can't stop the bleeding by by putting tourniquets on and 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 packing wounds. Um, the next bit I was going to talk about was just a bit about the setup of the vehicle um, and how and how you might do that if you have the option of having either an aircraft or a vehicle available to you. Um, do you want me to carry on talking or are there any? Yeah. Okay. Great. So um, this is the we were we we had the luxury in Afghanistan of having a Chinook helicopter. We certainly don't have that now because we could be in lots of different places. But we had the luxury of having a Chinook helicopter set up just for the medical emergency response team, which meant, as you can see, a lot of kit on the back of it there, but a large space. With medical kit at the top end, you can see an orange square, which was our ventilator, but we'd essentially set up ourselves a little bit of a recess bay at the top end, and there's a lot of kit hanging off there ready for us to get on the back and, and take off and, ha and be ready to receive casualties as soon as we landed. The reason being we didn't want to be on the ground for any longer than necessary because of the risk. Um, we pretty much knew that as soon as we landed, we'd probably be ambushed um, by insurgents and we really wanted to be on the ground for as little time as possible. So our, our treatment was on the way back to the field hospital, not on the ground. Um, and that translates into if you've got a vehicle and you're going out to pick up people who are injured on the ground, using the vehicle to just scoop into the vehicle and treating patients on the way back. So things that we would think about in that sort of instance are if you're able to tie kit to the sides of the vehicles to secure it so stuff doesn't fly around as you go over bumps and round corners, and also thinking about how you're going to bring the patients on, probably practicing how you're going to load the patients and secure them to stretchers to make that journey as safe as possible while being able to treat and provide interventions on the way back. So if you have a set up ambulance, that's much easier. But but even then, still having kids accessible and not flying all over the place is one of the challenges and something that you know, we sort of had to work around to, to make the most of the environment. And in this, this case, we were lucky we had nice matting for our knees. But certainly if you're going to be kneeling, um, a really simple tip of having some form of knee pads or foam on your knees so that you can wedge yourself in place and, and be comfortable if you're going to be on your knees for an hour or so sliding around trying to provide treatment is, is quite a useful tip as well as a head torch that might give you different colors um so so white light is great if you're not tactical but if you don't want to be seen by the enemy then you might need red light or blue light which will change your ability to see blood and how patients will look um, one of the other considerations when you're either in a moving aircraft or vehicle is how you assess a patient so certainly if you've got a headset on and you can't hear very well you then become reliant on different faculties like your palpation and your um, sort of a touch, feel, looking at the patient, not so easy if it's dark, as opposed to the listening and, and, um, to, to either to alarms or to, to listening to a chest or listening to sounds that you would normally use to pick up on problems with a patient. So just a little bit of difference in the faculties you'll, you will use when you're assessing the patient that we've had to learn. Um, and it makes communication between the team much harder. I will come on to that. Um, human factors bit, a, a bit later on. Um, the other thing I guess I would want to mention at this point is the makeup of your team. And in an ideal world, we had a team of at least two. Um, in the, we were lucky at the back of the Chinook to have a team of four. But in the UK, when we work in pre-hospital care, we would, um, as an air ambulance team, have two of us. And what that allows us is, is almost like a 
toing and froing between the teams, the so one person with their eyes on the patient and one person with a little bit of a wider view of what's going on, particularly if there's multiple patients and being able to swap between the two pa the you know, eyes in on a sicker patient and a sort of overview of everything else. Um, and that definitely helps with the idea that you can easily become task focused on something. Um, and having two of you enables you to bounce ideas off each other and really work together to optimize that team working rather than being on your own and a lot of that team working well is that you drill together. So if you do end up working with someone, even if you're thrown together for a day, just talking through how you're going to work and drilling it can really make that, that whole job go much more smoothly. And having someone having your back when they see you become a little bit stuck is, is a really important part of that human factors bit, which I'll, I'll, I'll go on to in a little bit more detail in a bit. But also having your force protection. So as a medical team, you will inherently be focused on the patient's you don't have the headspace or the bandwidth to then be worrying about your own security. So when, for instance, when I was a, a medical officer, I had um, the infantry battalion, I had an infantry soldier who would be my eyes and ears while I was focusing on the patients. And I know even for the, the doctors that work with the police, the armed police in France for the raid and the GIGN, they, they're not armed. And even when they go into somewhere like the Bataclan, then they would, they're not armed because they're focusing on the patients and they have this, the, the, the police officers to protect them. So I would encourage anyone going out into any of those areas, even if you, you are in the military and armed, that you think about someone else who's doing the driving, someone else who's doing the, the if you have the luxury of it, someone else who can provide that overview of your safety to, to ensure you're able to focus on the patients that you're managing. Um, uh, and then in terms of... Um, getting off the back. So we, on the back of the Chinook, we'd have that one of our paramedics would get off the back with the force protection. And this was essentially sometimes all we'd see just the dust when we landed and they would then triage the patients and bring them on to us. And actually, this gives me a good example of where that idea of bandwidth or tunnel vision can be quite extreme. So there was one case when we landed um, and we had some enemy fire coming in um, fairly soon after landing. And the paramedic was so focused on triaging the casualties in the right order to come onto us that he didn't realize that Air Force Protection were firing past him and the enemy were firing past him. And he was in the middle of all of this. He still didn't believe us, even when we got back to the base and debriefed it with him, because what had happened was that tunnel vision, which happens. And when you focus very hard on something, you're hearing your peripheral, your hearing and your peripheral vision narrow hugely, and you won't see and hear stuff like that, um, which is just quite an extreme example, but a really good example of where having that team and really being able to pull each other back into things and, and also having the person with the eyes out is, is really important in these sort of situations. And then how we work as a team with one patient, we would have one person at the head end, one person either side and someone at the foot end because you can't move around a patient very easily in the back of one of these things. Um, but it's very easy to become just caught up in what you're doing and 10 or 15 minutes would go without a plan and without a joint shared mental model of what the patient needed. Even more so, when there are three, four, five, six, ten patients. So what we developed with this idea of a timeout where really, really quick initial primary survey and then um, of, of the injuries and then a stop and a timeout. Okay, what have we got? Which patient needs which interventions most quickly? Which one needs the blood we've got? If we've only got four units of blood, which patient are we going to give that to? And which one needs the advance? The doctor maybe, which one needs other treatment? And how can we best optimize it? Because otherwise 15, 20 minutes goes and you haven't really got on top of it and achieved everything. So that timeout was really critical for us to, to optimize our team and our priorities. And that's something that I would encourage if you're working in a sort of an environment to try to do. Similarly, we would do that in the operating theater where the anesthetist would just do a stop and, and get the surgeons to, to at an appropriate time to catch up and work out where we're at so that we don't lose track of time. The patient's not on the table for too long and we don't lose track of, um, what's happening sorry my lights keep going out um so that sort of human factors thing that i'm sort of alluding to there is, is, is explained i think quite well in this um in this yerkes dodson curve where we look at um a simple task 
you really do need to be focused and you will not see or hear anything else. And if you're operating as a surgeon, that's what you need to do. So, but if you've got a difficult task where you're managing multiple patients, then you really want to be able to take in all that extra knowledge and information that's coming in and assimilate it into being able to make decisions and make things happen. So when you're fully aroused because there's lots of information coming in, your performance is as, but as good as it can get. But as soon as too much information starts to come in, you start to fail. And you know, I've noticed myself doing it at home. Sometimes I've got 10 jobs to do and I, I stand and walk in a circle because I start to do one of them and I start to do another and I start to do another and actually you don't achieve anything. So it's that concept of, of, of really trying not to overload your brain and the things we can do to try to optimize that, not only pulling each other back, but pulling ourselves back when we realize that the, there might be a problem. And that this... The medicine is medicine, and you know this talk is not about teaching people how to be a doctor or how to be a, a nurse or how to be a paramedic, but a little bit more about how to make that happen. And, and in our experience, it's usually the human factors that stop that happening when you know what to do. Um, some of the things we've learned over time are things like motor programs. So, for instance, when you drive a car, most people probably drive a car and don't think about how they do it because that program is so programmed into what they're doing that they do it automatically. So one of the things that we would do if we did a pre-hospital um, rapid sequence induction of anesthesia is to have drilled that so much as a pair that we actually don't have to talk about it and we don't have to plan and we know exactly what each other's going to do and you do the same thing every time. So the drugs are set out the same. You always use a bougie, you always use a kit laid out in the same way every time so that removes that question that you might have about how it's going to work and you have more headspace to decide what you're going to do and, the, and then the other thing is to not assume that if you say something someone's heard it because as we've seen people can focus and, and they might look like they're listening but they won't hear if they're focused on something talked a bit about the timeout after 90 seconds and that idea of a shared mental model that's really key that everyone's on the same page even the non-medical people can help you make stuff happen if you tell them what it is you're trying to achieve um and then it is worth remembering if in the debrief that everybody will remember the job in a slightly different way um so it's really important to just because someone said oh that didn't happen they may not have seen it happen they may not have heard it happen and that debrief is really important to work out why you did stuff and how it happened and what happened to learn from each patient that you see um and each experience and that's one of the things we focus on quite a lot as well those this is a huge topic so i'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail um i think we can probably um if there's more questions about the human factor side of things i could probably talk for hours on that um the people next bit... Claire, so, sorry uh there's lots of interest um people are saying could you slow down a little bit because there's, the, there's loads of really really useful uh key information there so um could you just slow down a little bit and maybe take a few moments to summarize the key points that we've got to so far um there's there's lots and lots of information there but the request is please can you slow down because they're really interested in what you're here what you're saying yes of course so uh so i think the key bits are probably um that in, if you, in terms of an, a sort of advanced pre-hospital care team, if you have the ability to, to have a team that is training to work together to go out and treat patients um, before they get to hospital, um, that you, if you think about the setup, think about your team, think about who's in your team, and ideally have at least two people as part of your team. Um, and then um, if you have the luxury of a vehicle, you can set up, think about the setup in terms of securing kit and equipment that you might have to make your, your environment as safe as possible to treat when you're moving, because it may not be safe to treat the patients in situ where, where, where you retrieve them from. Um, and then in terms of the, the sort of human factors or the crew resource management, thinking about how people can become task focused um, and not see or hear things and remembering to, to, to have that shared mental model. So a timeout or a, a stop to try to catch up with each other, make sure everybody's on the same page with the same priorities 
and using things like motive programs and drilling things that allow your your head to have more headspace essentially to, to make that happen i think that's probably the key bits of the bits i've talked about so far um and they're just also mentioning that the idea of the early treatment, you know, that buddy buddy aid of first responder interventions isn't the advanced medical team. It's the it's probably the people on the ground that are going to make a difference there. Um, and that was um, essentially where I was about to come on to in terms of timings. Um, and I think we know that from recent conflicts, there are some patients that die immediately that there's nothing we can do about. 10% uh, more die in the first 10 minutes. So we have a window there. These are not necessarily preventable deaths and the preventable deaths are the ones that we're most worried about um, because they're the ones we can make a difference for. But there are a few patients that we know we need to do something for in that first 10 minutes, a few more in the next 10 to 60 minutes and a few more after that. But essentially looking at targeting those patients in the early few minutes, it's not changed that much over time. This is older data from Vietnam, which has similar numbers. So there's 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 really critical interventions that need to happen in that first 10 minutes. And this was just summarizing what I was talking about to begin with, which is really those two causes of death in the first 10 minutes we think are probably or definitely airway obstruction and catastrophic hemorrhage. And those are the two things that the person next to you or a bystander, as we might call them, someone, a civilian, an injured who might be able to help you can, can do something about and is, is the, the thing that the medical response as such will probably be only there later than that and not able to, 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 to make that happen. So just doing a simple jaw thrust, um, opening an airway, if you can't stay with them, putting someone into the recovery position and making sure that airway is open so that they're posturally draining, even if you still have some incoming fire, the idea of care and fire is that you just pull someone onto their front and then move on and at least their airway is draining. And then the second bit of that, that immediate intervention is for this extremity hemorrhage what we call catastrophic hemorrhage. And again, if it's really properly catastrophic hemorrhage, you don't have very long, and that needs to be someone next to you. So we would train all of our soldiers to put a tourniquet on, um, uh, but it's not very easy to tighten it properly yourself, particularly if the injury is a high, like this amputation that you can see in this picture here um, on the, the right of the screen. Um, so putting that tourniquet on really high and tight, um, to make sure that that you've stopped any bleeding you can reassess it and move it down once it's safe and once you've got a bit more ability to take the clothes off and have a proper look at where the injury is um but we do know from afghanistan and iraq that that the introduction of tourniquets definitely saved um lives and reduced mortality from extremity hemorrhage by 85 percent um they don't all have to go on high and the picture you can see on the left is of a, a foot essentially and a lower limb injury and putting a tourniquet on below the knee if, if the injury is low enough will mean that there's more chance of saving the rest of that leg so where you put the tourniquet is important putting it on quickly and being trained to put it on for this type of, of, of sort of blast injury is really important and then the other injury that, that will kill people in minutes is this a sort of fem junctional arterial bleed. And that may not be from a blast injury. It may be from a fragment from a blast injury, or it, it may be from a stab wound or any other penetrating wound. Um, and this is we sadly see this quite a lot in London um, on the streets with, with, with stab injuries, not a typical battlefield injury, but people bleed from those femoral wounds and the solution is to pack them. And the thing that I would encourage people to focus on is it doesn't really matter what you pack it with, but packing to get to the base of the wound to press, essentially to, to compress where the artery is bleeding from. There are things like um, hemostatic gauze, such as chyta gauze or silox that you can pack in to help draw the water away from the wound and help the blood clot. But the key bit is the pressure and the packing at the base of where the wound is bleeding from. Um, and that again needs to happen if it's if it's neck, if it's axilla, if it's groin, it needs to happen quickly because it doesn't take very many minutes to bleed 
from an arterial bleed. And this idea of care under fire, of, of, of if you've got incoming threat, how can you manage this and still manage the threat is something that we're taught in the military where, as I mentioned, if it's just pushing someone onto their front to manage their airways, you go past them and maybe even throwing them a tourniquet to put on for themselves or giving it to someone who's a bystander who can help or using an improvised tourniquet. And we haven't talked about improvising here, but it is possible to improvise tourniquets in this environment as well. Um, and then we would move on to the sort of next step of interventions, which might be the more medically trained people, where you've got not just those basic interventions, um, but providing can intravenous access and pain relief. Um, some a lot of the injuries are difficult to properly manage in terms of tourniquets are really painful, splinting, broken legs is very painful. And it's it's hard to pack a wound properly if you're if you're in pain because you end up not doing it as effectively as possible if the patient's screaming while you're doing it. Um, so so there's there's definitely an element of certainly with 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 people that have been thrown who've got multiple blunt injuries. Um, fractures, fractured limbs that need splinting, um, that, that getting pain relief in early to be able to move them effectively is really important. And it's something that I, I think even in the civilian world, we're not necessarily that good at if there's certainly if there's a high threat area there. Um, blood, I think we'll come on to talk about a little bit later on. Um, but what we would aim to do if someone's lost a lot of blood is not to replace the lost blood with, with water, but replace it with blood products if possible. Having said that, if you don't have blood products, maybe you might have to use water for a little bit. Um, to finalize that kind of bit of the early interventions and then the sort of coming onto the slightly more medical interventions, I think there's, you know, that there's limited kit that you need to have available to you. And I'm sure most people are familiar with these sorts of bits of kit. Um, none of these bits of kit take very long to use. Things like the tourniquet, the the blood, the the sealox, the blast bandage for packing wounds, and particularly for the the blast bandages, using the blast bandages in a inventive way. If you need to get pressure on a dressing and you've got to leave the patient, thinking about using maybe the armpit or the other side of the patient as a, a, a like a fulcrum, a point to get pressure around, so that you can enable that pressure to be built up on the on the on the wound and then move on to the next patient. Simple airway adjuncts. Eye gel, maybe if you've got the ability to ventilate a patient or a surgical airway is something that a lot of our soldiers were trained to put in place. Um, so a surgical airway in the neck would be able to be put in a patient without an anaesthetic if they were had a completely obstructed airway. Obviously, it's not very nice to do that, but it does allow them to have a patent airway and breathe, and it's a fairly straightforward procedure if you're, you're trained in it. And then simple ad, adjunct or adaptations of procedures that we might do as advanced teams, such as a thoracostomy, so if you need to decompress a chest where a needle decompression is not enough, you might just make a, a hole with a scalpel and some Spencer wells, but rather than putting a chest drain in, which would take some time, potentially fall out and block, would be to just put a chest seal over that with a self-ventilating patient. And then later on down the line, when there's a bit more space and time, put the chest drain in or take over their ventilation. Um, so relatively simple kit and thinking about how you lay that kit out so you know how to access it would be one of the really important bits and little things. So just sort of summarizing some of those practical tips. I often take an ammo bag like this with just the things that I'd want on me immediately so that I know how to get to them and it's thrown over my shoulder and I can swing it around and access those, those bits that I need without having to get lots of bags off my back and open lots of kit. So knowing where your kit is and knowing what's in it can really help that sort of headspace, simple stuff like a small monitor for the sats and heart rate, um, scissors, head torch, knee pads if you're kneeling and anti-sickness stuff if you're tactically flying and you get really sick are, are, are just, you know, it's, it, it's, it's situation dependent, but they're things that we've, we've certainly learned to do. And that pain relief, the really important bit of pain relief. 
Claire, can I just interject? We're, get, we're getting lots of questions coming in, um, yeah. and uh, I'll try and structure them in some way. But just based on your last slide, one of the questions we had coming in was if you could only have one piece of kit or equipment, what would it be in the field? Okay, that's <laughs> that's 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 uh, challenging. Um, I, what would it be? Um, I think if it was hmm, one bit of kit, I think it depends who you are. I'm, I'm taking my time to answer that because I think you can, you can potentially improvise with tourniquets. I think the blast bandage, the, the field dressing you can see there is, is a very useful bit of kit that you can essentially make a tourniquet out of if you tie it tight enough um, and you can use to pack wounds and achieve hemorrhage control. If you're on your own and you've only got one bit of kit, it might well be that. Um, assuming I had something I could find to in improvise with a windless device. Thanks very much for that, Claire. If I, if I could possibly bring Selvan in here as well. Um, Claire spoke a lot about you know, the developments we've seen in recent years in pre-hospital care. Uh, do we have any information about how that has affected outcomes uh, over the years? Yeah, it had a wonderful outcome uh, over the years. For the very first time, uh, at the beginning of the second uh, millennium, the death toll of war injury has decreased as low as 10% of the soldier uh, in injured. During uh, decades, it has been stable between 30 and 20% of uh, war injury who will uh, ultimately uh, die. Uh, and actually, thank you, Claire, for your amazing talk about the amazing jobs that the UK have done, especially in the, um, in the Afghanistan. We have learned a lot. Uh, during the recent war. Uh, we have learned, first of all, that we don't have to uh, forget the lesson of the past, and war medicine still relies on very old concepts, like uh, the simplicity of the procedure, like the importance of training, and especially in teamwork, like some special concept, like triage. But what we have learned, and we probably explain that uh, the death toll has been divided by twofold. It's uh, about two main reasons three and three breakthrough, and we have probably one path to explore for the future. The two main lessons, effectively, actually, is that uh, the vast majority of the deaths occur before reaching a medical treatment facility, before reaching a surgeon, before reaching uh, an, an, an hospital. Uh, this is only true when you have a comprehensive uh, network of care, of course, because if you save someone at the forefront and there is no surgeon to, uh, to take care of him, uh, the, it, makes, uh, it, it, makes no, it makes no sense. The second lesson is the importance of time factor. The importance of time factor is uh, obvious for uh, anyone, but what is very important is that, uh, especially the uh, US, but also the UK, have nicely shown that uh, the death toll can be uh, decreased sharply when your evacuation time is below 90 minutes, probably around 40, 60 minutes. And also that um, life-saving intervention are not the absolute enemy of uh, time factors. It's important to do both. The three, the, the three breakthroughs that we have learned during these uh, conflicts is, first of all, the importance of tactical combat casualty care. TCCC was emphasized by, the, by, by Claire with the three phase care under fire, tactical field care, and uh, evacuation, uh, evacuation care. The second breakthrough is a civilian breakthrough now. Uh, it's a damage control surgery, but it's not feasible in the pre hospital, uh, in the pre -hospital phase. And the third breakthrough 
is the damage control resuscitation. And we have shown that the uh, outcome of the patient vary widely according to the nature of the transfusion therapy. Again, it's a breakthrough uh, from the hospital, but it brings us to the path probably we have to explore for the future. It's to bring the damage control resuscitation outside the hospital. Because the name, it's remote damage control resuscitation. It's pre-hospital transfusion, but not only pre-hospital transfusion, for example, use of uh, tranexamic acid. And our fear, to, to conclude, our fear for the future after the two lessons, this free breakthrough, and this path to explore for the future, we have one fear, is that to, uh, the, to lose the fire superiority and the air superiority, so we, uh, the risk is to lose on the evacuation time, and so probably the future will be prolonged field care, uh, which is probably not a good thing, but uh, we, don't, uh, we, are, we are not the master of the battlefield. Thank you very much, Silva, and thank you, Claire. Um, if I could just come back to something that we're often asked about and is probably very relevant to our colleagues in Ukraine at the moment, uh, and that's the issue to do with triage. Um, Claire, maybe if you could just tell us a bit more about the actual practicalities of triaging uh, when you're in a combat situation, uh, and also Silva, and if you could say a bit about that as well, maybe after Claire. Yes, of course. Um, I, I'm not sure if my slides are still sharing, but they don't need to be at the moment if they if they are. Um, in terms of um, triaging, if you've got multiple casualties, I think that uh, there's a there's a couple of different ways that you know you, that you you might triage, but. Uh, from the intuitive triage, which would be the you know, a senior clinician looking at the the, the, the casualties, the, the things that you're looking for are the initial assessment of any of those life threatening um, the injuries being treated. So hopefully it's already been done before we get there. But the, the a, a way of moving through the patient, so airway and catastrophic external hemorrhage are managed immediately. And then you move on to your assessment of, and, and I, I would assess each patient in terms of what the mechanism of injury is and therefore what the likely injuries I'm looking for are. Um, and in terms of battlefield mechanisms, obviously there's a number of different potentials from blast injury, gunshot wounds. Um, uh, it could be a rollover, road traffic accident, um, an RTC or crush injuries. So looking for what's happened, if someone can tell you, looking for the injuries that you find and then working out the, the physiological effects of the that when you're assessing the patient, whether you think that if they're shocked, is that shock? if you like, lack of blood pressure, lack of peripheral pulses, is that because of a cardiovascular reason that they've lost blood? Is it is it because of a, a ventilatory reason predominantly or is it because of a, a neurological reason? And we know that you know, severe head injuries can present in a not dissimilar way to patients who may have lost a lot of, of, of blood and have internal bleeding and they, they, they can look very shut down peripherally and very pale. And so that injury mechanism and the injuries that you find on examination, really nuancing your examination to, to work out what you think is wrong with the patient and why is the first step in, in knowing what they need and that triage then depends on where you are and what you have available to you. So if you have a patient with non-compressible internal hemorrhage, bleeding into the chest, abdomen or pelvis, and your, your surgical teams are hours away, then you may have to make a decision that, 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 that if you've got multiple patients like that, you may have to decide which one is most likely to survive to be the patients that you evacuate or that you go with them. Um, you know, this. We, we, we've we had the luxury and experiences that I've been in often having uh, good surgical teams and good resources nearby. Um, and if you don't have that, then it, it can become very difficult decision-making. Um, but the decision-making is really on what's potentially survived, most potentially survivable. And if you have limited blood products, 
some of these patients are likely to need huge numbers of blood products. They may be survivable, but given the time and given the the the, the distance and given the blood products available, maybe maybe they're not survivable. And that decision is a really difficult one to take. Um, and it's not the sort of decision that you necessarily want to make on the on the ground where there's a threat to you. And you you ideally would want to evacuate everybody, the people with a non-compressible hemorrhage first, essentially accelerating that flow of the people that need to be got to a surgeon. But if you're in a situation where you can't move people out and you're stuck, then you may have to make a decision on the ground and it may be a difficult decision to make. And I'd always say trying to make that decision not on your own if you have the ability to do it with someone else is is, is obviously a much better way to do it, as we would all know from, from trying to do that in an intensive care environment as well. So um, I think the summary of, of the triage, if you're a senior clinician and able to assess the patients and do that nuanced examination is to really look at what you think is killing them, what they need, whether you have the ability to get them to that and then prioritise particularly the non-compressible hemorrhage to get them to somewhere that can manage that. And, and patients that maybe just have ventilatory failure can be managed by an advanced team who can manage that on scene, for instance. And the patients with compressible hemorrhage can be delayed a little bit more than the non-compressible hemorrhage because you can essentially control that with decent packing and tourniquets. Thanks, Claire. And um, so when it, how about the actual triage process, maybe when the, the patients are being have been evacuated into a hospital and they need their damage control surgery, uh, how do you go about your triage process at, at that site? It's the same triage process like uh, all the NATO uh, all the, all the NATO the NATO army, basically four categories, those who need surgery right now. Those who need surgery within hours, typically six. Those who need, uh, those who do, don't need surgery, and unfortunately, a fourth category: those who are expectant. Those are the uh, if there are no uh, no uh, no espoir, uh, no, they they they, uh, they they won't survive. It's very hard to say, but uh, triage is of uh, paramount uh, importance. If you don't want to uh, to lose a patient who could uh, survive otherwise, what you have to keep in mind is that around 10 to 20 percent of patients we need surgery right now. 20 to 30 we need surgery within six hours, and all for the patient won't never need real surgery, but only but only the on, on dressing. So don't be panic. There is a twenty percent of the entrance of your operating room. There is only ten of them who need to be uh, operated, and probably two to three who need to be operated right now. Yeah, very, very uh, ethically challenging decisions, and um, I, I think. Uh, Carol, you had some questions, I think, around the human factor side of things you wanted to put to Claire, um, just following on from some of those, uh, you know, ethically challenging decisions that some of our colleagues in Ukraine may be making at the moment. Yeah, some of the questions that uh, are coming in around uh, how easy is it to train uh, civilian uh, medical and nursing teams to uh, undertake some of the processes? Obviously, uh, being in the military, your uh, trained uh, to think and work uh, along these guidelines that uh, you talked about um, from the off. How how long and how easy is, is it to uh, have somebody de novo in this sort of setting uh, to be able to uh, get them to be an effective member of the team, uh, bearing in mind that for for civilians, uh, these human factors will probably uh, be much more much more of an issue uh, because the environment will be incredibly unfamiliar. Uh, that's a, a really good question, Carol. Thank you. Um, I think, um, I mean, the, the medical. I think I think there's two aspects to training civilians, if you like, and one one is the medical interventions themselves which are not complicated at all and 
I think, you know, I, I spend quite a lot of time training police officers, for instance, to, to provide, if we're talking about the you know, stopping bleeding, opening an airway, those, I think anybody, anybody could learn to do that really quite straightforwardly with, with good instruction. Um, the, the, the challenge of doing that in an environment that is not a hospital, if, if that's where you're used to working in terms of, which is why I kind of talk about the practicalities of the kit and the layout, because those things are the things that you just, it takes time to get a little bit used to, but none of it's, none of it's difficult at all. Um, the, the idea of working in an area where there's high threat and I, I have no idea what it's like to be, for instance, in Ukraine at the moment. And, and I'm sure that actually they've probably, some people have got used to living in that environment all of the time and if that becomes normal then 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 already the stimulus it's not like going away somewhere new where you've suddenly got a, a threat that you've not become used to um I, I think it's it's eminently possible to train people to work in that environment if if, if that's where they are anyway and it's really about having an awareness of the risks of the threat of, of where you can become unaware of what's going on around you and, and and trying to have a setup where someone might be keeping an eye out for you while you're while you're doing those medical interventions. But I think the simple interventions can literally be done by anybody, and ideally should be you know, in this country even should be taught in the UK should be taught to school children. But I think they definitely can be taught to to people that, you know who, who might not have done them before in the Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, We've, sorry, go on. Uh, please do, Sylvan. Excellent. I think the, the, this is a very good question. The time needed to train someone, uh, it depends uh, greatly of the background of the, of the person. For example, for a civilian team specialized in, uh, in intensive care, we think in France for counter-terrorism purpose, we train them in one week. One week of uh, teamwork training but they are fully trained medical professional. For general practitioner, a military general practitioner, the recertification time, I don't know if it's a very good, very good word in, in English, for someone who have, who have been properly trained during his, uh, his medical school, there is a three weeks uh, pre-deployment training to be ready to be, uh, de to, to be deployed. For a surgeon, during his, uh, his residency, uh, he needs obviously uh, six years of uh, residency to become a surgeon. And during his six years, every year, he, he has uh, one week of full, uh, of full uh, military training. For example, for uh, an orthopedist to learn uh, how to, uh, to perform a craniotomy or a craniectomy and so on. For an anesthesiologist, during his five years of uh, training, uh, we perform uh, four uh, sessions of, uh, of uh, medical mi and, mi and military, uh, military, tra military training. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another question coming about uh, pre-hospital care. So if pre-hospital care has to be, uh, is continued and to, with a victim undergoing uh, damage control surgery, uh, in a in a makeshift operation, uh, operating theatre in the camp nearby. Uh, the question is: uh, are, are the is it to be expected that there are fewer safety measures uh, and more stress for the uh, anaesthetist and the intensivist uh, in continuing that work when you uh, get to that setting? Um. Sorry, just the, 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 is it expected that there's more stress because yes, they're nearby right. where the where the enemy is? Is that the yeah? I, I think, uh, but also I think it's moving from. I think what the suggestion is is moving from uh, a makeshift uh, um, area operating theatre where some initial damage control may have been done, and then when you're moving the patient to um, a uh, higher level of care, uh, as it were, does that, does that create a lot more anxiety and potentially um, less safety 
uh, for the uh, anesthesiologist or the intensivist uh, is the question. Is that I think it's it's the, is that moving and that um, and that changing changing of setting uh, does that cause more anxiety for those receiving and continuing uh, that initial care? I would say, I would say not necessarily. I think that the, the imperative is really to to get these patients to a place where you can stop the bleeding. Um, if bleeding is the problem and it's internal hemorrhage, they need something to stop the bleeding to allow them to, to survive to the point where they can have definitive surgery. And often damage control surgery is, is that initial bit. It's not the full formal surgical procedure. It's just the initial stopping of the bleeding to get the patient to a point where you can get enough blood into them fill them up, warm them up, and then complete the definitive procedure. Um, it's something that in the UK military, we've looked at with longer timelines to see whether we can e even do that procedure on, on, on the way as well. And rather than having the, the sort of pre-hospital advanced team doing that essentially A&E resuscitation only, can we have a surgeon with us and um, already in the UK, we would, as a pre-hospital team, we would do a procedure called a thoracotomy if it was indicated to release a tamponade from around the heart, um, depending on the mechanism of injury and the cause of the potential tamponade. But our surgical skills don't generally extend beyond that. Um, but if you if you could, on the way to the, 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 the definitive surgery, if that is four, five, six hours away, if you had a team with the ability to, to, to provide those surgical interventions on the move, then the key bit is that hemorrhage control, that stopping the bleeding, and then the patient will be in a better position by the time you move them to the next place. Um, it, the key bit, I think, in all of these bits, if you're moving between different teams and different locations, is a familiarity with your kit equipment and how you're going to move the patient, but also a clear, concise handover of information. And the bit where it often falls down is where the, the, the information isn't passed on, people don't know what's happened to the patient, um, and things get lost in that translation. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, if I could bring Sylvan in here, if we uh, sort of move now to the to the hospitals where we've got our patients who, and we've identified that major hemorrhage is uh, somewhere something that we may be able to do something about as regards uh, decreasing uh, mortality. Um, can you just give us an overview, and maybe some of our colleagues in Ukraine who are maybe working in their own hospitals, but they're civilian doctors, and the way they go about their normal work is completely different now. Can you just give us an overview of how the change of focus, uh, you know, what should they be focusing on for their patients now compared to what they may be used to doing? Uh, I'm not sure to have understand. Uh, your question is, uh, what do the civilian uh, pr practitioner have to change in their habits for the war surgery? Yeah, so, so for instance, um, you know, we may have surgeons, civilian surgeons, who usually they, they do definitive curative operations. But here the focus of what they're doing is going to be completely different. It's going to be about damage limitation, damage control. So can you just give us an overview of what the key messages are uh, as regards treatment now that we have our patient in, in a hospital where they can get further treatment? Okay. Uh, they are, so they have, uh, let's put on the word, they have to perform a damage control surgery. Damage control surgery is for uh, the sake of the multitude, uh, when you have a, a lot of uh, a lot of patients, but not only you have to do that when you have only one patient in order to do uh, to do it quickly, and because of the fog of war from close bits, you don't know if uh, in uh, some hours you won't have a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of casualty. The principle of the damage control surgery, or for those who are interested, can be uh, understood 
in a very uh, well done um, uh, podcast, uh, freely available in English on the NATO site of the of, of, of the comets, a five minutes uh, podcast. And uh, the goal is uh, to uh, operate the patient uh, in only 30 to 45 minutes for each site of, uh, of, of surgery for multiple uh, injuries. It will take, oh, it will take uh, hours, but the goal is not is uh, not to do a definitive surgery, but uh, only to do uh, damage control, mainly uh, control the hemorrhage to uh, stop uh, the to to to, re to repair to, to repair the gut and uh, and to uh, evacuate uh, compressive pneumothorax uh, mm -hmm. and so and so on and that's all. That's absolutely all. The surgeon don't have to close the to close the, to close the wound. He don't have to uh, do a, a perfect uh, surgical procedure. When you when you have to do that, that's over. Uh, the patient uh, have to uh, go out, out the operating uh, table and uh, to be uh, stabilized in uh, in, uh, in in the in the high C, in the ICU. This is damage control surgery. It is hard Thank you. for a civilian surgeon who like to do a very fine and a very nice job, but uh, it, has, it is of a paramount importance. Thank you. And, and you mentioned those uh, resources, those videos. Um, would you like to show some of your slides, Sylvan, and put up those those links for the videos so that uh, people tuning in know how they can access those? Do you want to show some of your slides? Okay. Uh, my slides are on the screen. Oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry. This is not on my slide. So I will send you by uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the WhatsApp group. I will send you the the, the, the link. Okay, and and uh, and perhaps you could tell us a bit more about um, blood products and uh, the strategy of uh, how our colleagues should go about trying to resuscitate these patients. Okay. Uh, so, in a perfect world, we would uh, like to uh, perform damage control resuscitation with regular blood products, including packed red blood cells, plasma, uh, and platelets. Uh, this is not uh, available uh, in the forefront, and sometimes it is not available uh, in, a, in a hospital. So, uh, armies used to, uh, to perform fresh cold blood collection either at the forefront or at the uh, hospital. It is a procedure uh, who is relatively safe, what is uh, what been uh, been uh, practiced extensively during the last uh, during the last decade, who consists in uh, collecting, here uh, on the forefront, on the slideshow, on, on the screen, after uh, a short collection of uh, the medic, the relevant medical history through uh, a pre-established uh, uh, spread, spreadsheet. And uh, this uh, procedure called remote damage control resuscitation is now well established in special force, like in the US Rangers. It is, uh, his name is Rollo for Rangers or low titer uh, transfusion. But uh, in the, the parachute, it's called Polo, parachute or low titer. In the UK Navy, it's called uh, Solo, sailor all, uh, all low, or low titer. So it is um, uh, the goal is to collect a product at the good temperature, containing all the products you need: red blood cell, plasma, platelet, fresh platelet, 
and to uh, give it to the worst injured patient in order to buy time, if the evacuation time is uh, too long, uh, or to save the, 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 wor the, worst, uh, the worst injuries. Uh, this is well uh, this is well known uh, even in the civilian not exactly with uh, wall blood but uh, the, we have a nice experimentation in the US and now in the UK about the free hospital transfusion and especially on plasma with very good results regarding the uh, patient outcome on, uh, on, on plasma and uh, this uh, can be do so this can be done with very simple device not the device we usually used in a blood bank you can see on the left of the slide but with more simple uh, device uh, dedicated to collect only uh, one bag of uh, of uh, wall blood to uh, a known body uh, body known to uh, to be of uh, type O uh, of type O of type O blood. Uh, in order to simplify uh, the, the task in the French Army, uh, we put all these uh, all, all you need on the uh, two bag, and when you open the bag, you have uh, the device in front of you, and uh, you have um, uh, a simple sheet. Uh, explaining you uh, how, to, how, to, how to perform that. Uh, it can be uh, secured greatly. It can be secured by uh, performing, if you have 40 minutes in front of you, performing a quick test for hepatitis C. In 30 minutes, you have a quick test for hepatitis B. And more importantly, in five minutes, we have a quick test for HIV. The question of typing the blood uh, is not as simple as it, uh, as, it uh, as we can uh, even, as we can imagine, because uh, a clerical error on uh, on the type could be uh, could have uh, catastrophic uh, consequences, and uh, we all know that uh, performing uh, a blood type as the bedside, like you can see and like you we all know on a paper card, like in a, in a hospital, uh, has a great, very great rate of uh, error. Either you have a very uh, special uh, card, like credit card, on the uh, lower right side of, uh, of the screen, or you don't perform that, uh, you don't perform a blood type, and you rely on the known blood type of the body who had been uh, established according the known rules before uh, leaving uh, before leaving in a in a, in a, in a, in a in opera, in operation. This is what is uh, uh, well established and uh, well known uh, for during the, the the last decades of uh, of, of war. And uh, Sylvan, if uh, resources mean that, that blood isn't available, is there any evidence of which fluid colleagues should be using to resuscitate their, their patients? And Claire maybe could give us an indication of what you, which fluid you use in, in pre-hospital care. We have uh, nice data uh, concerning that. Uh, this data come from the postdoc analysis of the pumper trial. Probably the best solution is to give uh, packed red blood cell and plasma or wall blood. But uh, if you have to choose only one, uh, probably plasma is the best option. If you don't have plasma, packed red blood cell is the best option. If, he, if you have neither plasma or packed red blood cell, Crystalloid is uh, better than nothing. Are you do you agree, Claire? Yeah, completely. Um, I t totally agree. I think uh, obviously, if you have the ability to give whole blood, then um, we you know, that's replacing everything. And and when you give 
di the, the, the separated blood products, they, they're diluted by default because you've separated them and diluted them. But um, we would give uh, absolutely that pre-hospitally. If you have it available uh, in the UK, we will give um, packed red blood cells and plasma. If you don't, some services have lyoplas, which is freeze-dried plasma that is reconstituted with water. Um, but ideally equal amounts of both um, if you have them available and if you have ne neither available um, then giving small boluses of crystalloid to maintain some circulating volume is better than not giving anything at all and I actually think it, there are some people that say that you should it, there has been talk at times of not giving anything at all but if the circulating volume is so low that you don't have anything circulating i think you do have to give something um and i think our best guess is a simple crystalloid do you get many problems with um if you're giving um blood in the field do you run into many problems with um um uh, anaphylactic reactions um, which just seems like a hideous perfect storm if you're in that sort of setting and you're giving blood and then you have um, issues with um, reactions to the blood products it's certainly not something that i've experienced i mean we we tend to be giving o negative and we have the luxury of having o negative blood um and i i haven't given the whole blood transfusions which if they're not properly cross-matched may potentially provide um, cause that kind of reaction but I think um, the patient's got a lot more problems with no <laughs> circulating volume if you've got to the point of needing to give them blood and I mean actually it's a good point that the decision to give blood sometimes it's really obvious that a patient needs blood um, but how much blood you give giving it just because you have it available and how much you decide to give um, you know who you give it to if you've got limited blood pouring it in if you've got enough blood getting in enough blood quickly can be a challenge as well and actually one of the practical aspects of that that you know that we've seen is and we had the luxury of doing when we did the um, MERT in Afghanistan we had space we weren't moving the patient and so we were able to get into osseous access into the patient's um, and we actually at times use our force protection, the infantry soldiers, when we were moving back to, to the field hospital to, to syringe that blood in using three-way taps. And we would have trained them, you know, spend all day with them, just turning the three-way tap, which can be confusing in itself to make that happen. And because they weren't moving and because they had that to focus on, that worked really well for us. But one of the problems we found in treating patients and moving them, certainly in some of the patients that we, we treat in, in London who um, are bleeding to death, is that we struggle to get enough blood into or enough any fluid into, into osseous access, particularly when you're moving the patient, that it's in the arm, it's catching. There isn't somebody dedicated to transfuse it in. And so we found that getting decent bore access whether it's either large bore peripheral access or actually we often now use central access and we put in a, a trauma line in the pre-hospital environment to get that decent central access to get enough blood in quickly enough um, clearly that depends whether you've got enough blood to give and whether you ideally are able to have a warmer to warm it with and again you know that's likely to be a, a resource that's not necessarily available thank you um, just uh, again, Claire, on specifics, uh, especially for those civilian doctors who obviously aren't, may not be used to pre-hospital care or, or, or the situation they're in at the moment, um, can you just tell us the specifics of, of the medications you would use for your rapid sequence inductions? I, I was interested by the fact that you said that you, you know, even out in the field, you use timeouts, you always use a bougie, but could you just tell us which medications you actually use? Uh, and then maybe we can come to Sylvan to, to give us a quick guide to how, how uh, anaesthetic should be given in this situation in the hospital. Yes, of course. Um, so we would typically use ketamine as an induction agent for uh, pre-hospital anaesthetics. Um, it's relatively safe in terms of maintaining blood pressure. Certainly, I wouldn't use um, propofol or fentanyl for a patient that's bleeding in terms of the, 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 that 
that the ability for both of those drugs to dilate um, the circulation and cause a, a significant drop in blood pressure in a patient that is maximally vasoconstricted anyway um, so we we tend we use a a range of ketamine and we came up with a um a way a, a either one milligram per kilo or two milligrams per kilo um of of ketamine or 0.5 if they're really sick um rocuronium at one milligram per kilo um if it's if it's not a bleeding patient and it's a head injured patient, then we sometimes add in fentanyl, and we would give a range of fentanyl between one and two mics per kilo. Um, uh, but essentially, fentanyl, ketamine, and rock uranium, but pre predominantly ketamine, and we would always have it drawn up in the same way. Um, and, and it's really just a decision about how much you're going to give based on the physiology as opposed to which drug you're going to use. So it removes that debate where you could use any drug you wanted to really, but it probably is the safest one to use there. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Sylvain, anything different in hospital? Well, what I teach to my uh, student for anesthesiology uh, for hemorrhagic shock is uh, four principles. Uh, the first is in wartime, the best anesthetic agent is uh, w w what you have. Sometimes you, uh, you, you can choose. So the best is what you have. The second is that you must keep in mind that the doses should be divided by two or three. And you don't have to be afraid uh, about that. There is some uh, physiological explanation to uh, to explain that people uh, still uh, are still anesthetized with smut, uh, so, uh, so 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 small doses because of the reduction of the, of the blood volume, the reduction of the, of the protein, and uh, and, and so on. The th uh, the third uh, answer they have to to keep in mind is that a resuscitated shock is still a shock. We have uh, an animal experiment and also experience showing that a patient who has been uh, whose, uh, whose blood pressure has been restored with the fluids transfusion and so on, for unexplained reason, uh, we uh, always need very small amount of uh, anesthetic. And at the end, the first answer, the simplest for those who are, who are started uh, anesthesia. Uh, use uh, one milligram kilo of ketamine. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got some more questions coming in. Carol, are there some uh, questions that you'd like to ask from our participants? Yeah, there are quite there are quite a few. So um, just going back to um, what Claire was saying about eye out access, what we're being asked is. Um, what's the best um, site for IO access for a patient having a dramatic blood loss? So, so I would say um, that we would put it into the humerus, into the humeral head um, in terms of access that's more central. So particularly if you've got lower limb injuries or abdominal injuries, putting an IO into the tibia is dist far distal to where the injury is and less likely to get into the, the circulation. I certainly found that it, you can use an iliac crest, but it's very difficult to get it into the iliac crest um, in terms of positioning and, and its stability. So what we used to, we did have two options. We had an, a, the, the humeral head, um, but also the fast device that you can put into the sternum. I've heard differing reports of which one of those is more efficient. I certainly, in my experience, found it more efficient to use the humeral head for, for syringing in intraosseous um, volume. What, what is important is that you do need to syringe it in. It doesn't run into the intraosseous needle like it would run into an intravenous cannula. You do need a three-way, if you want to get the volume in quickly, you do need a three-way tap and someone with a 50 mil syringe syringing it in um, and focusing really hard on not pulling it out because as you pull to, to aspirate into the syringe, it's really easy to dislodge the, the, the IO needle and you don't notice it until the, the shoulder is really swollen because it still syringes in quite easily. It's just not going into where you want it to. Thank you. Uh, and Sylvan, another question is um, around the COVID pandemic. Um, 
in the middle of a in the middle of a war um how would in your experience dealing with probably the um the, the fallout of um lots of covid on top on top of a ward um how can we advise our participants um around managing those in in potential infection uh, issues on top of um war situation with multiple casualties sorry i don't, I don't have data on, on on this issue uh, it's it's just your your opinion about what uh, how to manage the challenges uh, if if you ha if you can. I would say treat first, like but kill first. That's a that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, any more questions on the on the site? Um, um, I think people have found those links very useful. Um, are there any other sort of mnemonics or, or or checklists you use? I was very interested by what you said, Claire, that you still try and maintain those timeouts. You still try and maintain those uh, team briefs. Um, so are there any other sort of standard operating procedures or checklists or mnemonics you use in the field and in hospital? Um, so yeah, we have quite a lot of checklists in pre-hospital care. Um, we are uh, almost too many at times, to be honest. Um, but we, we, in terms of checklists in general, we would use uh, a checklist for kit to make sure that our, our bags are always packed the same way and the, the kit is in them and they're sealed so we know that nothing's missing. Um, when we do a rapid sequence induction, we would always use a checklist um, to make sure that we have everything out that we want to have out. And when you're not used to using a checklist for an RSI, it can feel like it takes ages, but actually what it does do is mean that you definitely have everything you need so that when you are when you have a problem, you've got your surgical airway kit available, you've got your eye gel available, um, you have the tube tie available, you have all of the things you need and, and you're not scrabbling around for it, particularly if you're moving and you've got to locate kit and if you're getting stuff out so you're not in a set up hospital um it, it's similar to setting up a, a rapidly set up forward sort of surgical team facility that you would want to checklist you had everything available end title co2 particularly um in terms of mnemonics um i guess from an anesthetic point of view there's something that we've used in the uk military at something called stack which we use just as a reminder when we stop stac when we um do our kind of 15 20 minute check which is just a um so sort of situational awareness what's the systolic blood pressure what's the temperature um uh, what, uh, what's the acidosis? So if you have the option of doing a blood gas, how, what's the acid, what's, what's the acidosis, what's the lactate doing to, as a sort of check with blood products? Um, what's the coagulation like? So how much blood product have we given? How much have we got left to give available to us? Um, and then, and the S would be the sort of surgical situation. So what has happened surgically? What procedures have you done? What are you planning to do next? So just a little checklist of the sort of physiology of the patient and the surgical procedure so that we can sense check whether it's, it's correct to carry on, whether we should be stopping, um, what else is going on around us and what, what's the situation on the ground? So what else is coming in? Um, and how do we prioritise our resources um, best? So that's that's a there's, I mean, there's a number of different mnemonics that we use for for various things, but I think those things can be quite useful. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you, Claire. And and Sylvan, anything you'd like to add on that? About uh, the checklist. Or, or mnemonics or anything you you think would maybe of use to our civilian colleagues in in Ukraine at the moment. Uh, yeah, uh, we uh, recently the French Foreign Legion have uh, performed for their medics a very nice experimentation uh, about um, cognitive heads. The cognitive heads, it's uh, roughly uh, a checklist. And it has uh, shown that uh, even with a great professional like them, it, it works, it, uh, it, it helps. So what we use in the French army of um, 
Le mnemonic, c'est the acronym SAFE, MARCH, RYAN, SAFE, SECURE THE ZONE, uh, et assess the scene, uh, let up, uh, free you of danger, and ev ev evaluate. So evaluate, march, mass massive bleeding, airway, respiration, circulation, uh, and hypothermia, and uh, ev evacuate. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've got a few minutes left, so it's, we've probably got come to the time where we, we need to sum up. Thank you so much to Sylvain and Claire for uh, your expertise. You've, you've shared some real pearls during the last sort of hour and a half. If I could just sum up my take-home messages and then maybe uh, we have a final message from each of you and from Carol before we'll close. So, Claire, you, you spoke about pre-hospital care, pre -hospital care and, and triage and uh, the importance of the equipment and the team uh, and how, how we can, or how our colleagues in Ukraine really can make a difference in, in that period. And, and Sylvan went on to talk about how outcomes have improved from the developments in pre-hospital care. Uh, and then Sylvan went on to talk about how the, the focus of our definitive treatment in hospital needs to be damage control, the importance of, of the blood products, uh, and the importance of, uh, of, of obviously the fluid resuscitation and doing the, the limited amount of surgery. Um, and if I maybe ask Carol to, to add any take-homes she's got, and then maybe if we finish with a final message from Sylvan and Claire. So, Carol? I think for me, some of the key uh, key take homes are around um, the use of um, checklists and routines to make sure that the whole team are on the, the same page. And it's encouraging that uh, those things can be talked to uh, non-military uh, personnel uh, in a relatively uh, short period of time. And the acute awareness of human factors, and I think that's um, really something to uh, keep in the back of everybody's minds of, around how effective communication um, can make all of these situations better or worse uh, if we're not aware of all of those. So thank you both very much. There's a massive amount of information there that um, we um, that I'm sure are going to be really useful, not just to our uh, Ukrainian colleagues, but uh, to everybody else listening. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think the final thing I would say is thank you very much for everything everyone is doing out in these really difficult environments with limited resources. Use what you're used to using will make things easier. And we haven't really touched on the blast injury, effects of blast injuries, but I think always look for the injuries when you're assessing a patient. Blast injuries can not be obvious. There may not be an amputation, but the fragmentation injuries can cause that non-compressible hemorrhage that can kill people or a pneumothorax to the chest. So really make sure that you look for the injuries that are available um, learn from the next web. I think the next few webinars are going to discuss the various different injury mechanisms um, and then use the knowledge of the various injuries um, and, and think about how you can make that work in the best way using your team and the human factors and the people around you. Your team will be your best asset and I think you've got an amazing group of people. So yeah, well done and, and good luck. Thank you, Claire. And Selvan, any final take-home message from you, please? Yes. We must keep in mind the motto of the US Navy, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Selvan. Um, just to remind you, following on from what Claire was saying, there are a series of webinars, and there's a, another webinar next Wednesday at the same time. So that will be uh, 5 o'clock. Central European summer time, and that webinar will be on crush injuries and penetrating wounds. So all it remains for me to do is to say thank you to Selvan, thank you to Claire, thank you to Carol, obviously thank you to all of our participants, and obviously our thoughts are with all of our colleagues in Ukraine and the neighbouring countries, um, and we, we hope that you can continue to stay safe, uh, and we hope that this webinar has been of some use to you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.
Thank Bye -bye. you all.